Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, uh, modern PT. Some oh, exciting yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. Lots of decks. Lots of, you know... I mean, no modern PT, you know, modern took a, a year off from uh, PT action. And uh, what is it like seven or eight sets later? There's a lot of new stuff in modern. Yeah, I, I like how a lot of the classics that people, you know, have loved in modern, you know, like I'm, I'm an affinity player. I'm a burn player, right? Like they get to keep for the most part, they get to play those decks. But we then at the same time we see angles on on decks from from being informed by some of the newer cards, uh, and then you know just a huge variety of decks. Nothing like seems so completely overwhelming, uh, but you know they certainly look dominating in certain matchups. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, like when we see affinity being just under eight percent of the day one field. And just over 8% of the day two field, 8% is a lot healthier than some of the numbers we've seen in the past, you know? Yeah. And Death Shadow, the boogeyman, you know, barely 9% on day one and 10.5% on day two. And that's even counting merging all the different Death Shadow decks. So I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I, I, I think it's really cool the amount of variety of both old and new decks, and how much there are new twists on the uh, the existing decks. So on the on the subject of Death Shadow, do you mind starting on Jean Emmanuel de Praz's Traverse Shadow deck from Top Eight? Yeah, absolutely. So, and this is a great example. Yeah. So one of the things that just jumps out at me is. You know, when we talk about Death Shadow or anyone, I think, who's been talking about modern for, you know, the past year or so stretch. When they talk about Death Shadow, they're typically talking about a Grixis deck or at least like a base Grixis deck, even if it's including Tarmogoyf. Here we have a deck that's being called Traverse Shadow, has three copies of Traverse. Yeah, I mean, the second Traverse you draw is a lot less good. Uh, but the but it gets better later if you're not too slowed down. Yeah, no, I don't know. It's interesting. I personally would play four still anyway. I, is, is the second traverse bad? I mean, like almost always, yeah, you, you could get no, like a huge is. creature or no, the second still is. snapcaster mage. So remember, this is a deck that only has two basic land. So like, it's very easy. Like if you're playing all five colors, yeah. Which, you know, like, obviously this list is actually all five. If you're playing all five colors and you only have 18 land and you only have two basics, it's it's actually kind of easy to get into a spot where you can't just make any progress with Traverse, right? Like, let's say, that, like, the first Traverse you cast, you go get Swamp. Because you have to? Is that, you know, a lot but of like, the time? But, like, going to go get Forest from that position does nothing for you. The second traverse is often not that good unless you have enough other stuff going for you that you can actually kick it, you know? And uh, DeBraz actually makes excellent use of the toolbox here. I mean, we've seen a lot of traverse Death Shadow decks that have, like, a Ranger of Eos or something, right? Like, or Ag or Clan Rampager. He's actually got a pretty sweet mix of stuff with a uh, Grim Flare and snapcaster mage and then in the sideboard and this is uh, you know i mean i'm no surprise a big favorite of mine a hostage taker which is particularly amazing in modern because of its anti-artifact abilities oh i mean you you took the words right out of my mouth his sideboard jean emmanuel de Praz's sideboard is like it's like melted chocolate it's it's so smooth <laughs> Wait, is that good oh yeah i who doesn't like melted chocolate? Look, this deck has got. We just like this. I'm just double checking. I, I'm just double checking. I've I've been a kid after a little league in the middle of the summer. You know, walking away from the Dairy Queen, melted chocolate all over my arms. Oh yeah, that's. It, it's like water. You know, sometimes water is great. Sometimes water is washing away your house. You know, but you know, I, I was thinking about like chocolate melted. You know, over over your ice cream maybe. But, okay. Uh, I mean, this this sideboard. I mean, let's, let's talk about the main deck and the strategy around the main deck, and then get sure, to the sure, this sure. Sideboard is insanity, though, right? So, uh, traverse the Uvenwald gets a basic in the early game, gets any creature later, um, and 
you know, here the bullet snapcaster mage, really exciting to me. Um, love that. You know, the Grim Flayer is kind of a redundancy card here more than anything else, I think, right? It's like kind of like Charmagoy five. Is that is that fair? Yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's it, it's a little bit of Tarmogoy five, but it's also uh I mean it is something else. You know, like it's it's a different angle. It's Orcish Librarian one also, right? Yeah, I mean it's yeah. Mostly though I think it's just Tarmogoy five. So here's a deck. It's got eighteen lands, but you know, a mix of fetch lands and um, and shock lands, which help it to lower. Oh, 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 oh! Sorry, oh. sorry, sorry. It importantly doesn't have the same name as Tarmogoyf, which is actually a key component. When the Maelstrom Pulse was a lot higher, partially for the exact reasons that Depraz only has two abrupt decays in his main deck. Yep. Maelstrom Pulse is a lot higher for this event, and sometimes you just don't want to be in a spot of putting all your eggs in the Tarmogoyf basket. That's an amazing point, yeah. I mean, we've actually seen many cases where Maelstrom Pulse is really meaningful, its ability to take out multiple threats of the same name. Um, but yeah, you know, here's a deck. It's got... It's got fetch lands and, and shock lands. Do you actually deliberately want to knock your own life total down? You're going to use Street Wraith to knock your own life total down to set up Death Shadow, right? The namesake uh, card in the deck, which is, you know, potentially not. It's never really 1313, right? Um, uh, I mean, it's not always 1212, but it is some of the time. Yeah. It's usually a little bit more 7-7 seven, seven and 9-9. Nine, nine. He's a pretty big guy for one mana. I mean, he's just, it, this, this deck is in some ways like a, a the rock deck, but just has a much faster clock. Uh, but it's got some super flexibility from cards like Stubborn Denial, which is a hard counter ish. When you well, have see, actually, creatures. Funny enough, even though it doesn't feature any Gourmet Anglers or Tassigers, in a lot of ways, this is similar to those kind of decks. I mean, like, it's not just the, like, Mishra's Bobble and all the discard spells and Stubborn Denial, you know, but you're really trying to, like, bottleneck them on, on mana. You're trying to be as ultra-mana efficient as possible and just present a very dominating board position in the first four turns of the game and disrupt them just enough to not be able to, uh, to, not, be able to properly defend themselves. Yeah, I mean, four Inquisition, four Thoughtseize can, you know, take away either the key kind of proactive card out of the opponent's hand or their ability to er interact with your threat. And then when you've got these creatures that are all four, four, six, seven, nine, nine, whatever, you win the game real quick in terms of attacks. And it's not even it's not even uh, just the the eight discard spells main. I mean, collective brutality is is no joke either, you know. But notably, one big departure, uh, uh, we've seen most of the Death Shadow decks feature Culligan's Command, and that is uh, very conspicuously absent. You know, the sideboard has two Ancient Grudges and a Maelstrom Pulse and that Hostage Taker, but no Culligan's Commands. Instead is only red, and also keep in mind, no Lightning Bolts either. Only red, main deck team or battle age, two copies, and then in the sideboard, uh, a Kozilex return well, to go with those grudges. Yeah, team or and another, age. yeah, of course. But I think the most, my, the most impressive card to me um, out of this sideboard is Ancient Grudge, uh, it, which is somehow I, I, I'm sure you remember, like in Extended a few years ago, it's like literally the best card in Extended, but it's like a forgotten card almost in modern. Nobody plays this card. And I think this, right this second, Ancient Grudge might be at its all-time height at Modern, and very few people are playing it. Yeah, I think Stony Silence has taken a lot of spotlight, but uh, there's also just been such an influx of other options that people have diversified. You know, I think that people have been going after uh, Affinity and the likes with much uh, bigger plans with stuff like the Shatterstorm type of cards, like you know? Shattering Spree. But, right, and then there's also on the other side of it, and yeah, Shatter Spree, Vandal Blast too, but then on the other side of it, Ceremonious Rejection, Abrade, Culligan's Command, all these versatile anti-artifact cards have been reducing the need for as many Ancient Grudges. That said, we're back to a spot where Ancient Grudge is, uh, you know, it, it, a hot, hot product. Real, real good in this meta. Um, but then on the subject of flashback cards like Ancient Grudge, uh, you said that 
that DePraz's deck is all five colors. I've never seen this before. Godless Shrine and Lingering Souls in the sideboard of a four color ish. No, that comes deck. up. Yeah, I think that comes up sometimes. I mean, it's it's a bold move here, but people bust that out sometimes. That's a vintage move. They do that kind of stuff in vintage and legacy. We don't see it very much in modern, though. It's usually a vintage or legacy move, and uh, I think it's pretty sweet here. I mean, it's- you know, obviously in, in legacy they might actually be doing it with lingering souls, whereas in in uh, vintage it's more often. You know, uh, partially a, a hedge against stacks mixed with boarding in a third color of threats, you know. I mean, it would certainly take me by surprise, I think, if I were playing against a, a shadow deck that all of a sudden I was playing against a, a white-black tokens deck when I was preparing for, you know, green and, and black early game creatures of huge size. Well, and part of it is these uh, two Iliana of the Veils, a little bit the Grim Flare, but mostly the two Uliana the Veils and the uh, the Cyborg three collective brutalities. Sometimes you just get a little bit of value. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but well, a big part of it is people just want to be fatal pushing, and, and basically people are going to just be trying to kill your Death Shadow and Tarmogoyf. And when they do so, they don't want to see Lingering Souls. I, I mean, we'll get to this deck eventually, but I don't think I ever saw Jerry Thompson cast lingering souls with white mana the entire weekend i think he was just always discarding it to one of his own cards and then flashing it back just who cares about the white um but you know DePraz has at least got access to that godless shrine after sideboarding uh notice something on the the space of death shadow it's uh it's important to note that even though grix's death shadow was uh two and a half times as popular as uh, more than two and a half times as popular as uh, Traverse Death Shadow. Traverse Death Shadow was multiples leagues above it in uh, in performance, and not just the you know Depraz being the highest finishing Death Shadow. The uh, overall, just across the board, the win rate of the Traverse builds was. And don't get me wrong, the Grixis one was slightly above average. It was very close. Is very close to even, but uh, Traverse Death Shadow was one of the best performing archetypes. Yeah. So, do you have uh, any speculation about that? I mean, we, we were kind of. I think it's much better. We, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, oh yeah. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a Jund or five color or four color. Basically, I'm a Traverse Death Shadow guy compared to Grixis. That's crazy to me. You're you're a Grixis guy almost every other time you can be. Yeah, I don't know, man. You, you, there's there's a time for branding and there's a time for winning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what do you attribute it to? The Tarmogoyfs or you know the flexibility of the sideboard cards? Yeah, a combination of the. I mean, I I think both. I think Traverse is just a fantastic card. I think that having Ancient Grudge in the sideboard is something I'm very excited about, and I think that. Tarmogoyf is still just a fantastic magic card. Uh, I agree with with uh, most all those points, especially the comment on Ancient Grudge. I think the the stock on this card through the roof, and I know you already mentioned it, but that taker in the sideboard is is a work of inspiration. I think it's so cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was a big fan. I thought that was really cool. I also, by the way, uh, I think the Kozlux Return is is pretty smart here. The only question is. Does it do enough? Does it do enough against the human decks? Because it's not the deck you want to face. Like, it's actually a little bit... um, You're a little bit behind against the human decks that we saw two of in the top eight. And you can't reliably anger the gods. It's just not realistic. And I think that the deck, the human deck, is too fast and... uh, Bellqueller puts you in too bad of a spot for you to rely on uh, a four cost sweeper. So, like, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Are you? Is Radiant Flames possibly an option? Well, I think that you know the Kozlux return gets some additional points, though, right? Like, it can it can also damage protection from red creatures. I don't know if that matters. That's true. It's an instant. You know, I, which I don't think it. Co- I, yeah, I don't think the protection from red will end up mattering too much, though, because remember, this is a deck that doesn't even have lightning bolts. It's not like anybody want. Like, I mean, yeah, they're th- not firewalkering you. That's that's not happening. Right. Yeah. So I actually, I don't know. 
I don't. I just worry the Coastal Oaks return might not do enough. Yeah, that's a that's a dilemma. Uh, so there's a different graveyard. You know, on the topic of Tarmogoyf, uh, it's kind of it's not a Tarmogoyf deck, but it is a graveyard deck, and it's one that we talked about on the show a few weeks ago. This black red hollow one deck. Oh, like Ken, Ken Yuka Hero. Yuka Hero. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just did. I, I played against a lot of these decks on Mitgo going into the Pro Tour, and it's, it's so cool how many different angles are going into the into the into the modern format. Like, you just don't anticipate, you know, your opponent's tapping R on the first turn for a beatdown creature and its Flame Blade Adept. Right? That's just not <laughs> just not the one that you you would guess. I think a lot of the time, but. It is awesome in this deck, right? It's Flame Blade Adept. It's a it's one mana for a one two with menace, but whenever you cycle or discard a card, it gets plus one plus oh until end of turn. And my goodness, does Ken Yuka Hero's deck have a lot of ways to discard cards, right? He's got Burning Inquiry, Collective Brutality, Faithless Looting, and Goblin Lore, all to discard cards. And plus, I mean, Street Wraith is something. Oh, sure. And it's possible to cycle Hollow One once in a while. It doesn't usually come to that, but you know you can. Uh, I yeah, I, I think that Flame Blade Adept is a very lethal threat here. I mean, it's typically uh, a four-two or a five-two. You know, it's and it's um, it's very difficult to block. Having Menace is also not trivial. So if he just puts down a Flame Blade Adept on turn one. If you don't have a bolt or a fatal push already up, it's one, it's not like you can block, and two, you're you're probably taking at least four or five from the one drop, and you might be taking seven or eight. Yeah, I think that it's it's uh it's worth pointing out. You can be in a situation, right, where it's first turn flame blade adept, they play um a burning inquiry on the second turn, which uh causes them to draw three cards. Oh, both of you to draw three cards and discard three cards, right? Uh, that puts the Flame Blade Adept all the way up to uh, to four power, right? Uh, they could play their second land and then rebuy Flame Wake Phoenix. They might like get Flame Wake Phoenix and Blood Gas or something on the second turn, uh, which is like a profound amount of power uh, early and potentially attacking, even without going crazy with Hollow One, which is I think the big payoff of this deck. Dude, you can also get some high rolls. Sometimes you're like, oh, my opening hand is no good. Then you're just burning inquiry, and then your opponent discards the only two land in their hand. Oh, I, I've never had that happen to me. But what I have had happen to me more than once is if you're just, like, going to, uh, you know, tutor for your next turn, right? You're, like, casting some kind of tutor, whether it's a traverse the Uvenwald or, you know, you're getting a particular land if you're playing Tron. You're not necessarily going to make that play that turn. Or you're doing some sort of searching effect, and your opponent's just like burning inquiry, roll the dice, and you end up throwing away your awesome thing. That that feels terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, I I, uh, I think uh, burning inquiry, faithless looting, and goblin lore. It's definitely an interesting question of the critical mass. Like, is this critical mass of efficient draw and discard effects so good? I mean. Like the, that, this this deck is kind of catapulted into uh, the t- into like serious play now that it's got enough payoffs as well. I mean, we're not even using cathartic reunion in here. Well, no, I mean, like it's not that Goblin Ore, I think is a better cathartic reunion. I think that it's a less dangerous re- uh, cathartic oh! reunion. Uh, you know, I don't like, know, man, like. Draw uh, di- getting to discard three instead of only getting to discard two. Well, I mean, it's not the three that you necessarily want, but I think that the I think that one of the huge advantages that Goblin Lore has over some of the other one and R uh, versions is that uh, all of the draw and discard happens as an effect of resolving the spell versus as a cost. I think yeah, that's, unlike that's yeah, unlike. Unlike Collective Brutality, Tormenting Voice, Cathartic Reunion, all those type of... Yeah, so the so the big payoff on this deck is Hollow One, and you just have some draws, right, where you're just like multiple Hollow Ones on, on turn one or two, right? That's the... That's like kind of the, 
the big, the big, uh, yeah, I think Hollow big, one is, big threats. Yeah, I think Hollow One is frequently coming down on two, but it does come down on one sometimes. Like, if you go turn one Faithless Looting, if you just so happen, you know, like, if you just so happen to to be able to, to pitch stuff, you just got to be careful, though, because, like, uh, you also need to have something like a Street Wraith yeah. or something. You know, like, if you Burning Inquiry and don't, you know, hit your Hollow One, then you can, like, do some crazy, nutty things right out the gate, but... I think you'll often want a faithless looting just to fix your hand. Like, let's say the sec only has 18 lands, right? Just so right. Like, fix a one land hand, you're like, all right, I'm a faithless looting, do this on turn one. And like, oh, well, all of a sudden this hand's quite explosive. You can, you know, you discard a blood ghast and, and uh, you know, draw a street wraith. You can, you can do some damage, I think. Uh, a couple important things to notice out of the sideboard. First, of course, your two ancient grudges. No other green. Just uh, one stomping ground in the deck, uh, the main deck, which he can fetch up with all of his fetch lands in order to uh, support these two ancient grudges in the board. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, equally important in the, the deck that we looked at a second ago. That one godless shrine, every single fetch land in John Emanuel's deck can find it, right? Because it's a, a, a swamp plains and all of his fetch lands get swamps. Mm. And uh, notably, Ancient Grudge has great synergy with all these draw and discard effects. Absolutely. And, and then the uh, the other card is Big Game Hunter. Oh. You know, we've talked about this on the show in previous weeks, but here we see it in action again. Big Game Hunter, great with all these draw and discard, or discard and then draw type of effects, you know? Yeah, it's so powerful, right, in context. Like, you're making like the forward action that you want your deck to do, right? Which is to do like either fixing or draw discard, and then it's card advantageously taking out something like a Tarmogoy for you know some other huge creature, Grimflay or something big, and it still counts as a discard. Right? Mm-hmm. That's that's the the gross part about it, dude. I love getting the people that like if a Jund player. Has like you know what I mean? Like the Jund player Liliana's you, and they're like both of us discard, <laughs> and you're like, sorry about that Tarmogoyf. I mean, this deck is so resilient against Liliana, right? Like even just discarding a blood. Oh yeah, I just a get... flame wake Phoenix. Anything is just yeah. Horrible. I don't think they're really uh, yeah. I don't think they're really going to be doing that to you. But what do you think of Grim Flare, man? I mean, Grim Lava Mancer. Grim Lava Mancer is like a dope cyborg card against humans, right? Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, you're just going to switch switch gears because this deck is like. I think kind of hit or miss on defending itself, right? It can defend itself okay sometimes. Hit or miss. It's, I think it's miss more often than it's hit. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there are many creatures in this deck that have the text can't block. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's got Lightning Bolt. I think, I think Grim Lava Mancer is just aces. And actually, I, I don't know if you would side it this way, but Big Game Hunter often has text, right? You can just take out Champion of the Parish. Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, for sure. And Thalia's Lieutenant. Sometimes. So, you know. Uh, so actually on the note of the humans, uh, whose build did you like better out of Mangucci's or, uh, Dominguez's, uh, humans decks? You know, obviously their main decks were nearly identical with, uh, uh, Mangucci having a Kithion hero of Acroas and Dominguez having a, a Miser's Kessig malcontents. But uh, a little bit of variation in the sideboard. I thought that Kessig Malcontents was actually pretty impressive when I saw it. Like, I thought that that was uh, it, it was very different, right? Um, it's not a super heavily played card in this archetype, and it gives the deck a meaningful amount of reach. Uh, you can knock the opponent down. Uh, also, especially if they're not expecting it. I mean, it's not like this deck is real good at, at aiming for its humans, but I think I think it's a cool uh, additional thing going on. Versus, I mean, I guess the Kithion will flip pretty consistently against some opponents. Be only yeah, one. yeah, I think part of it is that he just wants another one drop. Yeah. Um, just because the deck's often just so long on twos. And the big difference here is that uh, Malcontent is basically, a you know, the fact that Malcontent can be played for three mana, it's similar to Kithion because Kithion is often not the first to the party. But gets played in a turn along with a two drop. Because I think part of it is also just the fact that when you vial on one, you really do want to have a one drop to play with it. Yeah, of course. You know, that's the thing. Uh, I mean, that that is the thing. You know, it depends. Like, what what cards do you do you prefer? Like, 
you know, there's a one graph digger's cage in one sideboard. There's two in the other. I mean, I'm not so huge on on non creature spells in this archetype. Obviously, I think both of us really appreciate the is it Staticasters that they're playing. Definitely. Um, you know, but what do you think about gut shot? Gut shot instead of uh, just more reliance on dismember, like as is traditional. Uh, I mean, it's it's different, right? Like it, it's certainly better against another humans player in the early game. But I think it's, I think that if you're going that direction, you probably want the versatility of a dismember over the you know the lower downside risk of a of a gut shot. Generally, like you're not ever going to cast the gut shot properly, right? Like that could the deck even do that? Uh, n- not really, no. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel. I, I mean, one thing that I do like, I think, about uh, Dominguez's deck, he's got one Kataki and one Vithian Renegades. Um, I'm a huge Kataki fan, uh, even though he's a legend. Yeah, but, but, what, yeah, but Mangucci's got... I mean, Gucci's got two Katakis. Yeah, but I, what I'm saying is I actually like the presence of the other guy next to it instead of double Kataki. Ah, okay, sure, sure. Because, sure. Um, you know, Kataki is like an assassin for affinity, you know, and... It's pretty good against uh, Lantern, Oh, yeah, too. it's really good against Lantern also. But, like, if their opponent has, like, other artifacts, like, they're, like, you know, they've got, like, one or two good artifacts, just not really sure. pay for it. But, like, Vithian at Renegades can at least aim, you know, and I think that that's a... Uh, that's a... Okay, these are, like, pretty minor... Uh, pretty minor degrees, I think, I, to I, them. I just can't get into Kambal... Uh, Kambal co- console, console of allocation. Um, yeah, I don't... I it's not the worst, it's just... I, I it's, it's hard for me to... <laughs> To keep that one down. I mean, what do you not like about it? The Herlin Minotaurness <laughs> of it, the incredibly slow grinding of it, the, the fact that like the major archetypes where life gain matters can remove a two three quite easily. What part do you not like? I maybe I'm missing something, but who is it you're boarding it against? Storm? It's a little I don't slow know. against Storm, and this deck already has yeah. a, outstanding tools against Storm. And they literally have Lightning Bolt and are boarding in Anger of the Gods. You know, like, I don't know, man. I don't know what you're supposed to... Uh, maybe it's maybe it's good. No way. I, wouldn't you rather just have Sin Collector against Storm? There's a lot of things I would rather have. There's so many things I would rather have. Okay, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of that card. Okay, okay. I was just making sure I, I wasn't missing something. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a, a little bit different of a blue-red deck. Um, Pascal Viren's blue-red Pyromancer deck. Curious uh, your thoughts on uh, this little bad boy. You know, this is kind of like splitting the difference between several different blue-red decks. You know, it's a little bit the blue-red young Pyromancer uh, thing in the ice type of, you know, it's also a little bit like a blue-red control deck, and it's a little bit like uh, almost like a, a splinter twin deck. You know, like it's it's kind of an interesting hybrid. Yeah, I, of all the usual blue-red stuff. I l- really like this deck. Um, I think I think I like this deck for a pro tour format, which is what which is what Viren is playing it in uh, because it has an interesting combination of things that are are all potentially, you know, he could flip he could flip heads when he wants it, right? So the ability to go thing in the ice and then I don't know what that means. Flip heads? Yeah, like um like he has a lot of he has a lot of potential different upsides on his deck, right? That are all potentially really good in in different spots when he doesn't know what the opponent's playing. Like the thing in the ice part of his deck, like you said, is kind of splinter twinish, right? He has like this kind of I can upheaval Tarmogoyf, right? And it's dangerous, and they're like, it's really good against go wide decks, right? Like, an 04 is a very good blocker against humans, and the opponent has to go wide to get around it. You can flip it over, and, you know, it's, it will super overperform. It also overperforms in, in situations where maybe a graveyard deck is going to go wide. Uh, it has four toughness, so it synergizes well with Anger of the Gods. Like, all of those things are are powerful statements that that make thing in the ice look good same time he could he has an overwhelming potential offense with young pyromancer he could play like this really fairies or fish sort of i have a good threat and then i'm just gonna either or a visions oh. he could just put visions on one and then just buy time like fairies yeah 
Uh, and then just like win with one or two good threats. You know, the, but the pyromancer just snowballs in any match where the opponent doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't remove it. Like it's very plausible to play young pyromancer even against Storm on turn two. They don't remove it. You just like you know get rid of their their uh, goblin electromancer, and then it's really hard for them to make forward momentum against your remands and spell snares and so forth. And you just keep generating value and kill them in maybe three attacks. You got to watch out when you have thing in the ice. You got to watch out for people's mutabolts, which are horrors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, curious. Uh, what do you think of his decision to have zero blood moons in the 75? He's got three field of ruin in the main and his sideboard has one crumble to dust and one molten rain. Uh, I found it odd to not play blood moon. I think that blood moon is, it's just a free win card that a deck like this can easily play. Like he's got four islands and once, uh, I'm sorry, four snow covered islands as well as an Island. Um, you know, Lots of fetch lands to go find them. Yeah, it's a uh, and you know obviously those fetch lands can still tap for mana. Um, you know it, his deck doesn't even need doesn't even need a sec. Oh, I guess he has cryptic command um, and and logic not both, which uh, require multiple blue. But yeah, I, I think that I would have wanted to play uh, Blood Moon somewhere in the seventy five at maybe two in the sideboard or, or even more than that. I also found it odd that he has one Vendillion click only and it's in the sideboard. Yeah, and actually on the note of Vendillion click. My preference for blue red is still Paul Rietzel's Madcap Moon. You know, in cons- uh, structurally, it's got a lot of similarities to this Pyromancer deck, and in fact, he actually transforms into a Pyromancer deck after sideboarding. This is a uh, blue red uh, Platinum Imperium being fetched by Madcap Experiment. Yeah. You know, and just a lot of the same things, you know, all the usual like lightning bolts, some cantrips, a little bit of permission, cryptic commands. But then he's got Vendillion clicks to help, you know, whenever you accidentally draw a Platinum Imperium, but it can also clear the way. And then he makes good advantage of Opt, now legal. And then uh, he's he does actually have Blood Moon, however. Yeah, so just uh, on, on the note of those, the Platinum Imperium combo with Madcap is like a lot of decks just will never beat that in game one right like they have little to no way to interact with a creature that size and you know find some other way to win you just like sit back and and kind of don't block right uh versus i think there are a lot of decks that can beat uh viren's kind of combo-ish draw just by racing or they can it can remove a thing in the ice when it's on the stack something like that uh but I do think that there's a lot going for this deck. I, I, I like the four Snapcaster Mages. Love it. Uh, I think that it has some weird cards, though. I mean, look, Roast is such a compromise card to play in the main deck. Don't you think? Not that it's not a good uh, card. It's you're, just, it's, you're talking about it back in Viren's deck? Back in Viren's deck, sorry. Yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's hard for me to get into Roast. I, I get it. It's okay. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't. One, I would prefer to not roast, which is one of the advantages of playing like uh, the way that Paul does. You know, because like when you have Platinum Imperium as a backup way to kind of control the board, and it sounds funny, but I I really like Spell Snare more than Roast. <laughs> well, I mean, but the Imperium, like, think there's tons of decks that have a, a lot of removal but can't easily but, kill an Imperium. Like they they have fatal pushes or abrupt decays, just can't even kill it. Bolt. Yeah, like, I mean, they, they could draw three of those or something, right? But, like, it's it's real hard to remove from the board. Uh, but just back on the note of Viren's anti-land sideboard cards, right? like, Crumble to Dust is more expensive than a Blood Moon, and Molten Rain does less uh, for, you know, even against non-basics for the same amount of mana. I, 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 I wonder, though, I, I wonder how much advantage he got by people boarding in enchantment removal. Maybe so. Know. I mean, it, this deck, well, look, he can retain his ability to cast Cryptic Command, which I think is difficult under a Blood Moon in this deck. Not impossible, but it's pretty hard. Uh, yeah. and, then, and he can compound, right? He can go like Molten Rain, Cryptic Command, you know, Flashback, Molten Rain or something. Um, and uh, that's that's a very attractive potential tempo line, I think, uh, in some matchups anyway. Yeah, and it's not like Blood Moon is like so perfect in this deck where uh, a lot of the tempo cards he's got 
get less good when the opponent has lots of colorless lands laying around as long as the opponent, you know, if the opponent can cast anything. Uh, what do you think of these abrades, man? I love it. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't think abrade is a high power card in modern, but I, I mean, just if you want to compare two different, you know, one for one red removal cards in the main deck, you know, that cost R1 and he's got abrade and roast. I, I, I can understand wanting to play roast, but I'm kind of like, eh, your deck's also blue. There's things you can do. You can crypt a command around this. But the abrade is just, it, it gives you another dimension. I think the same reason that you like that hostage taker. I like the sure. abrade. Uh, yeah, that's okay. One thing. I'm more about the abrade in the board. It was a little loose. To oh, me. that's super loose. <laughs> You can yeah, I don't mind the sideboard in a braid. I don't, I don't mind the braid in the main, but the braid in the sideboard is like a monument to compromise. I mean, isn't a vandal blast so much better? Like, to it depends. Play like, one? it depends on what you. I mean, it is against artifacts. It's not necessarily against, you know, goblin guide or something. I don't know. It depends on what all like against humans. Do you think that he's so, siding in a braid against goblin guide? He's side. Uh, probably he's got so many bad cards against him. He's probably at the very least boarding in a braid against humans. That's fair, you know. But like, I guess if you just want to contrast those two decks, like I think Viren's deck's pretty bad against Goblin Guide, and Paul's deck is great against Goblin Guide, even though they're both very similarly structured. Uh, one thing that I would say that I love about Viren's deck, though, is look at how subtly excellent it is against Go Wide Graveyard, like against Dredge deck. He has like few or no like dedicated ways to just like re- you know progenitus somebody out he's got like one relic of progenitus but he can defend himself so well with young pyromancer and anger of the gods and just win the game uh you know thing of the ice there's so like all his just his baseline strategy is just so elegant at defending himself against those kind of opponents i i really really have a lot of admiration for that sure yeah uh one other uh sorry to be jumping back and forth so much on these two but entrancing melody is a uh, a card out of Paul Ritzel's sideboard that is uh, kind of a newcomer in the format. So tell me X you blue want that. blue. X blue blue gain control of target creature with converted mana cost X. That's an expensive control magic, right? Uh no, it costs four. Control magic costs five. And you don't have to give it back. Like when you're playing against uh Jund, they could abrupt decay your threads of disloyalty. Right? Or if you're playing, uh, if you're playing against anybody with bounce like Cryptic Command, if you're playing against Death Shadow and you want to steal it for just three mana, you know, being able to actually steal it for so little is pretty nice. And then as the game stretches out, you start picking up some really sick options. Like one, you can Snapcaster and Trancing Melody, which you can't do to the other control magics, most of them. And then uh, two, uh, the, the I think that the, like what other control magics are there that cost four or less, right? Like if you use the if you use the energy based one from Kaladesh, it costs five. And I think that it not being a permanent is a really big draw. So outstanding anti Tarmogoyf card, obviously. Oh yeah, and Death Shadow. Uh, I mean, I remember back when Olivier Ruel and Kenji Samura were just playing take possession against Tarmogoyf. Okay, that's seven. <laughs> Not in modern, maybe, but you know, just against the card Tarmogoyf. So being able to do it at four is really, really exciting. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think this is a very this is a very solid card for modern. Just given how cheap all the like, so many of the threats are, you know. I mean, I think that I could get behind an entrancing melody before I got behind roast, right? Like, it, oh yeah, it costs twice as much as roast, maybe, but it also no, costs, but sometimes twice. it only costs three. Yeah, and sometimes it only costs three. Anyway, I mean, seems I, good. I, I can't get but this deck has thing in the ice and cryptic command. I just don't know why I'd ever want roast. That's to do <laughs> off the road. All right. <laughs> you just sit here roasting roast. All right. I'm roasting uh, roast. Dude, the Pyromancer deck after my own heart, though. Jerry Thompson's Mardu Pyromancer deck. Oh, my God. Swoon. I don't know. Did you get a chance to watch Jerry in the top eight? Dude, Jerry is a hero. Oh, Jerry is a true hero. Oh, my gosh. So he's he battled back, and then in that, that fifth game to make the finals, he he... 
he bedlam revelers away all of his bedlam revelers into all yeah. lands. Oh my yeah, God. brutal. Win no problem. So this deck, Mar- it's allegedly Mardu Pyromancer, right? Because of lingering. Oh yeah, it's a white card. Yeah, no, it is though. It's um, lingering souls is great with Pyromancer anyway. You get two extra tokens. <laughs> Not Jerry doesn't, as far as I can tell. No, but, dude, that's what what that's what Manamorphos is for. Yeah. For. Dude, what kind of you just got blood one bill? one Manamorphos in his uh in his in his sixty? Yeah, I don't one. know that I don't know that any human does. But if the question is what sort of a god does, dude, Jerry, when Jerry does it, it was right. Seriously, there were so many. It wasn't even just Jerry, though. There were sev- There were a lot of people with weird numbers of manamorphoses because it's just so free. It it powers up the pyromancer like it's an extra token, you know. And then it also just makes things just work out a little better when you have a blood moon down. So, what do you think about playing two blood moons in the main and then sideboarding two molten rains and a ghost quarter? Oh, I like it. I like the Blood Moon's main. I think you just get so many free wins. Yeah. And I like when you have Blood Moon main uh, going a different direction. Remember, he's also got that Fulminator Mage, too. Yeah, I, I guess a second or th- even third or fourth whatever Blood Moon. Once you have the first Blood Moon, the next one doesn't do very much, right? But right. Every, every Molten Rain is a uh, you know, little, little kick in the shins. Right. And, uh, dude, I think Manamorphos... I, I think people should be playing Manamorphos more often in their Death Shadow decks. Um, yeah, yeah. We thought, yeah, hey, I guess I have a lot of colors. So let's let's run through all the all the the details on this deck because it is. Uh, I, I played against this archetype a lot in paper tournaments as well as on Mitgo, and like I feel like yeah, this deck was all the rage on Mitgo the week before the Pro Tour. The numbers here are different than the numbers I think I'm used to. Seeing. Oh yeah, so definitely. Only one copy of Liliana the Veil in the main deck, and then one. No, 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 but it's actually one. But that's actually an addition. Most of the way that people, so most people don't even play Liliana at all in these decks. And so Jerry is up to one in the main deck and one in the sideboard. I, I like that extra staying power. I think it's odd that they don't play Liliana. It's actually excellent with this strategy, right? This deck's got. You know, lingering souls. It it's fairly weak to large creatures, right? It's it's a uh, it's got to terminate in a dread bore, maybe. But you know, most people, yeah. The industry standard is just playing a fourth Colligan's command instead of this Liliana. But I like the Liliana. I like. You know, it. yeah. No, I like it. So and then, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, four young pyromancer, I think is is pretty standard in this strategy. But four yep. bedlam reveler, I think. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. It's only, no, 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 not in the Mardu. It would be unusual in any of the blue red ones. Yeah, the Mardu decks. Uh, the, it's always just four pyromancer, four reveler, and four lingering souls. That's the package. Okay. Yeah, and part of the reason you have to do that is that without all the cantrips, you just don't find your reveler as often. <laughs> And yet and then, he manages to pay the reveler for two all the time. Oh, yeah. Well, part of that is faithless looting yep. and collective brutality. Just in terms of being able to fill your graveyard, you know? What do you think about this split of four Inquisition of Cause, like three Thoughtseize in the main deck? Oh, it's interesting. I mean, most people just play four of each yeah. or so. or they play four Inquisition and three Thoughtseize. I think if you're only going to play seven, uh, I like Thoughtseize being the one you cut in this list. But I think he could go either way. It's just so hard to tell. It's not really seven because he's got two collective brutalities in the main and two in the sideboard yeah. also, right? So and three Colligan's commands. Yeah, and all those Ilianas also. So I guess I guess the opponent never has any cards, regardless of cutting a thoughts ease. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, dude, one Manamorphos, I think, <laughs> is actually pretty dope. Yeah. I, 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 dude, I like it. I, he's, like, you don't. You don't just show up and play a Manamorphos instead of the third collective brutality unless you know what you're doing. Uh, I think that the, I am so impressed at the staying power of Col- of Coligan's command uh, of all those commands that were that were printed uh, with their Dragon Lords a few years back. You know that wasn't the one that I was. Said, this guy is definitely going to be the the all star that that lasts in in long standing formats. But it has. I did. Which one were you expecting? Uh, Tarkas. I'm sorry. Not, uh, well, Tarkas and Dramacus, I thought, were both uh, because of their 
their cost. Costs, I mean, yeah. A lot of people play at Target still, right? But it's- no, they don't. Just you. The world doesn't revolve around lava spikes. I'm just saying, people play at Tarkus. Good people, moral people play at Tarkus commands. Uh, and, but I actually thought the Dramacus commands would, would be, because it's so flexible, uh, but nobody plays it, even though they're yeah. green white decks. There's just a lot more artifacts and enchantments these days, bro. Yeah. I mean, nobody, nobody thought that Silumgars was going to be, <laughs> you know, no, only Kai thought that one was going to be, uh, was going to be popular, but man, Culligans has been outstanding. And, you know, just that play when Jerry got back his Bedlam Reveler and forced Viren to discard, and the mm-hmm. match ended. And he, Jerry was so blank, and Viren had, he was like an inch from winning on the board. Um, it was exciting. Uh, what do you think of Reed Duke's, uh, I mean, this is such a Reed Duke deck, his uh, green-black splash lingering souls that is, uh, you know, what is this? His third top eight? This is, you know, like uh, this is such a reduke build too of uh, of black green and uh, a lot of artifact removal in the form of uh, abrupt decays, maelstrom pulses, stony silence in the sideboard. You know, yeah, a lot of stony silence. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is he's got a healthy respect for the uh, the 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 affinity in the lantern. Uh, so. The real question I have is he's got two Nile spell bombs in the main deck, and you know Jerry played a couple Nile spell bombs in his sideboard in addition to three surgical extractions. Talk to me about Nile spell bomb. Why is this the the anti graveyard card of choice? Well, so the question is, uh, what are you trying to accomplish, right? Because he's got his own Tarmogoyfs and Grim Flare that he really needs. So he can't really use things like Relic of Progenitus to very good effect. You know, Nile Spellbomb just points the one way. Mm. And it is an artifact for powering up his Tarmogoyf and his Grim Flare. Uh, what's more, oh, and then, sorry, he also has Lingering Souls, so he can't use any of the symmetrical stuff, right? Leyline of the Void is the wrong way for him because it's so all about your opening hand. He doesn't actually have very much to take advantage of the Leyline if it comes too late. You know, like he doesn't need the Hail Mary of get it in your opening hand or it's nothing. And uh, Nile Spellbomb g- still giving him more card flow limits how much you're just stuck with a bunch of reactive cards. I don't super love Stony Silence and Nile Spellbomb, but if he's that sure, you're not ever going to want both at the same time. Uh, part of the reason to play so much Graveyard Hate, though, is just how powerful all these different dredge type of decks you know we talked about the hollow one earlier but i think that there are a variety of different ways that dredge can be showing up that are very well worth respecting and that's not even counting if you if if some joker shows up with like living end or something or vengeance combo stuff like that. right and then he remember in addition to this nile spellbound he's also got this graph diggers cage you know like as an extra another graveyard hate card the thing that's that's so tricky, though, is I it's so hard for me to be into Graft Digger's Cage when you have Lingering Souls in your deck. Because remember, Graft Digger's Cage is symmetrical. But if he's only like if he just wants Graft Digger's Cage against like you know Obs on Company decks or something, maybe. I just I worry. Like, are you do you really not want Lingering Souls against them? If you don't, okay. But that's just, you know, that's that's one that I'd have to just see what his plan is there. But I have no doubt that it like that the numbers will just end up lining up right. Yeah, I think his his um, his plan there has got to be something around using his kind of three mana cards, whether it's Lingering Souls or Liliana to just like just build some advantage, force his opponents to commit and then use Damnation and then mop up with card advantage. Right. Because his opponents got like a one engine card and then a bunch of little goofballs and uh you know he's got he's got these much more powerful sort of engine engine stuff with uh planeswalkers or or built-in two for ones or these highly highly advantage generating creatures in his deck right like Glim, grim flayer scavenging ooze dark confidant and tireless tracker every one of those cards is kind of like an engine card yeah, and he's also got five plus one Lilianas. That's a lot more Planeswalkers than we usually see these days. Oh, yeah, five Lilianas. <laughs> yeah, a sixth in the board. 
that I think he has, he has to have so much conviction to play this archetype, right? Like, is this just a black... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's in his DNA. I think that Reed... It, I, it, don't get me wrong. He's a man of pretty absurd levels of conviction. But I just think that he's playing this archetype by default. It just takes a monumental force of nature to in some way ever stop him from playing this archetype. I mean, just let, let's just let's look at some of the details of this, right? He's so playing essentially a black green deck, right? So it's a black green deck to the point that he plays the card Treetop Village, right? It's got Treetop Village, but he's splashing for a shambling vent, one shambling vent in his white sources along with one godless shrine and one temple garden to play three copies of Lingering Souls in the main deck and... And three stony silence. Three in the stony board. silence in the sideboard. And, I yeah, mean, but you got to admit, if you were going to guess the one card that somebody has three copies of that's white in their main deck, you would definitely get it right. And if you were going to guess the one card that they have three copies of in their sideboard, you would definitely get it right if you knew the main deck card was already the main deck card. I mean, like stony silence is just fantacular. So, I mean, how would how different is this if the, if you just go red and play ancient grudge, right? Um, Pretty different because of how good lingering souls is. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's matchups that we're not, like, just thinking about on um, in in this top eight where Lingering Souls is just insanely productive against, like, an Ink Moth Nexus, a Blink Moth Nexus, uh, you know, a Glistener Elf. Like, those... those any of- blue control deck, any black-green mid-range deck is just one of the best deck... One of the best cards in the format. Any Liliana of the Veil. Like, it's devastating for Liliana of the Veil. Yeah, Liliana the Last Hope, uh, not as bad against it. No, very good, actually. <laughs> Quite good. Uh, but Liliana the Veil, very bad against, uh, against... How about that Tireless Tracker? That is... That's so... That's cool, right? You got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you got to remember to board that one out when you board Stony Silence in, unless you just want to live dangerously. Um, I don't know. He could, it helps him get the city's blessing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I can't do very much of the city's blessing once he's got it. Nah, yeah, nah, not a ton. Uh, I, I, there were there were a few decks that I thought were that were kind of compelling outside of the top eight. Like, uh, wait, wait, oh, go ahead. yeah, outside the top eight, who is in ninth place this this pro tour on break? Yeah, yeah, Johnny Magic. How disgusting is that? He's he's on breakers outside. Was that seventeen top eights? If he if he made it in. Okay, so here's the part that's even sicker. So what is quite possibly the best metric, like if you just look at the list it produces, it's so unreal. The list of if uh, take somebody's top 20 Pro Tour finishes, don't adjust nothing, no fancy nothing. Just take the Pro Points, the, the 20 Pro Tours that they earned the most Pro Points at, add that up. That's the person's whatever this stat is. Yeah. The list is unreal. You know, it's like literally John, Kai, Nassif, Paulo, Luis. Like, if you just go down the – like, it's just an unreal, unreal list. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the sick part is that this ninth place finish doesn't give John anything. <laughs> it's not good enough. It's his 21st best finish. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's insane about it? Because he played, he played green, uh, green Eldrazi, right? So yeah. he might have just won the Pro Tour. If he made it an eighth, right? His deck actually lines up pretty well against this top eight. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's a known feature. Yeah, Johnny Magic is no one to be trifled with. Ninth on Breakers. Wow. Yeah. But kind of knew going in that it was going to be, you know, going into the last round that it was going to be a real long shot, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, What did you think of uh, another top 16 finisher, Corey Burkhart? As always, Grixis control, winning with Grixis when nobody else can. You know, when I when I hear those words, first thing I look is how many copies of Cryptic Command he had. 
Why would you need to look? And I, I just, just to validate. And Corey can't. Corey doesn't come with less than four crypto commands. But then you just on the subject of commands. I said, well, how many calling commands? This time it's four. That's pretty intense. But I don't even care about either of those things. The man played a counter squall, and he played another counter squall. Hell yeah. Corey is a man of principle. Counter squall is is the real deal. If I actually, I I, I don't know that burn is very good anymore. I would just totally play. What? <laughs> this deck is everything just, is always back to burn. This deck is just a deck after. My, I don't. There's not a card in this deck that I don't love, uh, except maybe the Pia and Kieran. But I assume it's right. Really? I I was looking at that one, and I actually kind of like it at this spot here. You know, I, like I think you do need another threat. It's not the most powerful, but it's not the worst. It's it's you know? expensive. It's it, you can't cheat it, right? It costs four. It's always going to cost you four. Snapcaster Mage basically always costs you like four, five, you or cast six it in this deck. Moon. Yeah, I don't know. That's is that enough of a feature? Like the deck has four Crypto commands, four Coligans commands. Like I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't want to play another threat card. I'm just like a four is not sexy to me, dude. Um, Search for us, Conta, just digging, oh. and sometimes just discard the Pia and cure no R so you don't have to draw it, and then you just get it back with Culligan's command. I mean, just the <laughs> inevitability of that search for us, Conta, with Snapcaster Mage, and then you flip it. This deck has four cryptic commands and four Culligan's commands. Like, if, if you have a race, and I use race very loosely, like, there's some quotes around the word race. You're like, we're going to race to turn 27. There's not a deck in this, in this tournament that can compete with this deck on turn 27. He's got Search for His Kanta, all these commands, Snapcaster Mage. And it's just one of those delicious games where you just add a little advantage, add a little advantage, add a little advantage, get your opponent for two. Get your opponent for two. Get your opponent for four. You know? It's just... It's great. Uh, we, we had already touched on humans, but was curious your thought, uh, thoughts on uh, Lucas Esper Berthoud's... Uh, he was playing five-color humans with a little bit of spice in the form of... Uh, not only does he have two Kessig Malcontents, he's got two copies of Experiment 1 as extra one-drops. So, which is a human, of course. He's a human. Yeah, that's a. Um, I don't know. It's a. It. I think that it is shaving a, a freebooter and a meddling mage. I. I like it better than Kithion. I don't think I like it better <laughs> than either of those other guys. I think that meddling mage is really meaningful, and well, I guess it depends what you're aiming for because meddling mage and freebooter are both really good against. I think kind of the similar kinds of decks, and they're really bad against other aggro decks. Well, not horrible, but not great against other aggro decks. And then he's also got the Daredevil, Dire Fleet Daredevil in his sideboard, a couple copies of that. Yeah, I mix it up a little bit. You know, can do something something a little bit different there. Uh, so the Dire Fleet Daredevil does give you a meaningfully different um, thing that a human's deck typically can't do, right? Yeah, just in terms of uh, a little bit of grinding. I don't know. I just I worry about it, like if it's reliable enough, you know. Um, yeah, it's a little slow. It's another could be good though. It's good against lightning bolt. Yeah, well, not really because it's a human. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Julian Berto's white black zombie Berto, yeah, Orzo of zombies. So his only creature creatures. Are four grave crawler, four dread wanderer, four tide house scholar, and three blood guest. But then, of course, he's got these four lingering souls. Uh, in his mana base, he's got three mutavolts and two shambling vents. And then he's also got four smugglers copters. <laughs> I just I like smugglers copter. I like smugglers copter in combination with uh, with uh, some of these. You can play out of the graveyard cards. Yeah. What do you think of uh, Surgical Extraction main deck? Um, I think that you only end up there if you're, if you're playing your, your, uh, uh, your deck and you just end up probably in the course of playtesting. There's one of your teammates always gets you with something and you want to be able to stop that thing. Uh, well, I don't know. So it's, it, here's, the, here's an argument in defense of Surgical Extraction. 
he's got three Liliana the Veils and four Smuggler's Copters. This is not actually the worst deck for having a high leverage situational card. So you're saying he can just get rid of it if it's not good. Yeah, enough. and he's even got a collective brutality. So, I mean, he's got eight ways to, like, do something with the card. The one thing that I'd, I'd question more than that, because he's got the one copy of Surgical Extraction, is three Bloodgast, right? Bloodgast seems like one of the most natural cards to play uh, in this strategy, and he's only got three. It's not a zombie, though. That's the tough part. I'm not saying that should be the end-all, be-all, but being a vampire spirit... I mean, but I think that the Liliana the Veil Smuggler's Copter argument is even strong. Like, Bloodgast Smuggler's Copter, Marsh Flash, yeah, seems like I, a pretty easy thing to put together, right? It would like, be hard for me to get away from uh, the four Bloodgasts. What do you think of those Smallpox, though? I mean, he's a creature deck, right? So Sort of. I mean, I think that the Smallpox can go the wrong way for this deck a lot of the time. That's... <laughs> I, what I about sometimes it's good and oftentimes you just don't want to do it all right what about the t- damnation in the sideboard instead of bantu's last reckoning um i don't know i i don't know that it's necessarily instead of bantu's last reckoning i think damnation is well, no it is by def no i'm saying like i'm not saying that most people don't do it the same way most people play damnation i was just curious if you thought there might be any merit to bantu's last reckoning um i don't I'm not a big not really. on Bantu's Last Reckoning. I actually think Damnation's kind of a stretch here. He's only got 22 lands. Well, that's why Bantu's Last Reckoning. Yeah. That's the exact reason. There, the, here's the thing about this deck that I don't like. Um, I think it's, it, its proactive strategy is only okay, although it has a lot of synergy. But he doesn't really take advantage of kind of the, the level of... Um, uh, the kind of level of of press that you can get out of being a, a black deck that has some creatures. Like he's only playing two copies of Inquisition of Kozilek, three Thoughtseize and one Collective Brutality. Like even if you look at Jerry's deck, or certainly if you look at the, the Death Shadow decks, they lean so hard on that, on that uh, level of discard. And I think like Julian's deck takes so much longer to win. You know, I, I think like he would get a lot of leverage out of those, out of those kind of, uh, of sorceries. Sure. Uh, so it's not really, uh, I mean, it's not really got anything new, but just sort of a, uh, a nod to your philosophy, your, your sort of school of, of the magic. Yeah. Delavi's burn deck. Uh, he only, you know, narrowly edged out a winning record, but it's good that somebody <laughs> did with burn for your benefit. You know, he's got uh, – he, he actually, you know, kind of killed it in draft. But uh, wondering what you think of uh, two Skullcrack and two Grim Lavamancer for this sort of flex spot and then no Atarka's Command, just Boros. Um, that's how I play it. There's, two well, I, Grim Lavamancer, two Skullcrack? Main deck, yeah. And then in the sideboard, he, he actually still has the green, even though no Atarka's Commands. He's got in the sideboard – Three destructive revelries is his only green cards. Uh, I think that's that's pretty common. Um, I think that in a pro tour, uh, destructive revelry is much more defensible than it is in in a, in an open tournament. Um, in an open tournament, especially if you like, especially like let's say you're playing like a, a local tournament, a PPTQ or something, where you have a better grasp of what a lot of the other players will be playing, then you can make a. A more focused decision, but in a in a pro tour, I think if I were going to play Stomping Ground and Destructive Overly, I would play all four. And how do you feel about the lack of uh, what's the red white card that you burn players always play that does like some damage back, prevents all the damage to you from one source, and does all the damage back? Oh, uh, Deflecting Palm. Yeah, I don't really play that card anymore. Okay, so I guess he's on the same page as you. Yeah. Uh, and that card finally, was really good, like, when Death Shadow players were way ba- way worse. Like, when those guys, like, now Death Shadow players are all real good. And, and like, they're stripping your hand like crazy yeah. with Collective Brutality. But when Death Shadow was a zoo deck, that card was insane, right? Ah, like, yeah. Like the, the, when they were, like, a, you know, a red-green deck splashing for a 13-13, it was, it was really, really good. Now that they're basically, like, a Grixis deck that's, you know, as fast as a beatdown deck, it's way less good. 
Uh, and what did you think of its snaring bridge as a sideboard option in Burn? Uh, I think that it, you know, depends on the metagame. Sometimes it's great. Uh, I, not my style, but I've certainly played it. Okay, sure. Uh, so it's a little bit of, of uh, you know, kind of unassuming technology. But uh, God, where, where did it go? Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. So Michael Bond, uh, Bondi, uh, playing Blu-ray Gift Storm with an unsubstantiate in his main deck. A very flexible, can actually, ra- you know, can't that give you a little more storm count, like in a pinch? It can. Yeah, so also kind of proxies as a counterspell, right? Mm-hmm. I almost wonder if people should be uns- unsubstantiating their snapcasters more often. Uh, I mean, but I don't know. But the thing is, like, you can only play it's so, so slow many way. That's a hard way to do it. Like, and yeah, at the end of the day, why would you play so much of a variety when you can just play more ops and yeah, stuff? Like, I don't think there there's any bonus points you're getting for cuteness, right? The, like a lot of the guys who are playing these these strategies are trying to compact the most deadly deck that they can inside of three turns right like that's their that's their way uh a little blast from the past uh maximi augers mardu pyromancer deck one night's whisper (laughs) one night's whisper uh yeah well i don't know it's a that card's certainly been good sometimes right people who don't have opt are known to do strange things (laughs) Well, or it, it's, did he have a Manamorphose? No, right? <laughs> no, I guess you have Knight's Whisper instead of Manamorphose. They're very similar. That's the reasonable. It, well, you know what card, what deck I wanted to talk about? What? Yellow Hat's uh, blue-white control deck. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so, one of the greatest of all time with a very yellow hat list. Gabriel Nassif. <laughs> so, uh, one of the greatest of all time. This is, like, super in his wheelhouse of the last couple of years also, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Pathologically, one might, one might say. So, here, I, so, but there are still, you know, let's, let's uh, pick apart this deck a little bit. He's got four Spreading Seas and four Field of Ruin main deck uh, for, like, which is, and, and, and to, a, to a lesser degree, three Cryptic Commands, right, that are all kind of doing this mana disruption thing. I'm thinking, like, what do you think about that th- not having the fourth cryptic command, but then playing Jace Architect of Thought at four, like that's something. That I don't like, mind that. Eh, I really want that fourth cryptic command. I think, I, uh, dude. I really like Jace Architect of Thought. Yeah. What about yeah? Gideon Glimmer Jura, of Genius like is the one. I like getting Jura. Glimmer of Genius is the one that it's just so hard for me to get behind Glimmer of Genius instead of a fourth cryptic. I mean, I kind of love one settle the wreckage, three supreme verdict. I kind of love that. Like, it's just giving me a little bit of a scratch. That I love. I love that, dude. No, no, no. I love that. Especially a lot of the time, the opponents don't even get any lands, right? Like, they don't have any basics, and you're like, <laughs> this card's just insane. Yeah, maybe. Um, I like the Wall of Omens. I kind of wish there were more. Uh, but the, the one I love is Gideon into the Trials. He's got one Gideon into the Trials. But I, I feel like if I want to play this archetype, I'd play multiple Gideon in the Trials. Just subtly speaking, if you play Gideon to the Trials and it resolves against, against, for example, Lantern, it is awfully hard for them to win. Not saying they can't win, just not easy. Um, so, yeah, actually, speaking of which, we probably should at least, like, briefly mention all right. the, the first strategy to win a modern Pro Tour without Scalding Tarn. Okay. So right before we do that, I just... How crazy is it? That's actually true. One question. One question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of artifacts before we get to Lantern, why does this deck have no Crucible of the Worlds main deck or sideboard? This is a perfect Crucible of the Worlds he's Because he's, he's not as fancy as you. Like one in the sideboard? Against whom? People he wants to feel really smart and dominating against? Mirror? Yellow Hat could win the mirror if he just mold the six in the blind. Yeah, all right. You seriously, you don't think you don't think that there's any value to that card? It seems no. Awesome. There's plenty of value, but he literally has four spreading seas and four field of ruins. 
You only have so many sideboard slots, and his sideboard cards are fantastic. But it's great with Colonnade. His primary win condition is Colonnade. So what? That's not the problem. He's also got three Planeswalkers and Vendillion Click and Snapcaster Mage and Search for Azkanta. Uh, I don't know, man. Net, net, I think this is an outstanding choice for Modern if you were going to... Let's say for, for some reason you weren't going to play Burn. I think this deck is an awesome choice. <laughs> it has so much play <sighs> against a bunch of different kind of strategies, and it has the boom diggity sideboard cards. Timely reinforcements, dispel, stony silence, all awesome, awesome sideboard cards. You're just gonna crush people if you if you play this deck at a high level of competence. And Search Rest Conta is again awesome in this deck. Hmm. But then there was Lantern. Ugh, Lantern. What do you think about Lantern, Patrick? Uh I try not to. <laughs> Um, it's like it's like all of the worst parts of Sensei's Divine Top without almost any redeeming qualities. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I have a I have a contrary opinion. I love the fact that there is in this format that, you know, people can win on turn four with Storm or Beatdown decks, a deck that isn't about just playing creatures and or burn spells and or combo pieces and smashing someone. Whoa, 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 but hold on, hold on. Let me make sure I understand this. Is it that you like playing with it? Or is it that you like playing against it? I actually like playing against it, but I like that it exists, generally speaking. No, so it's it's much more you it's like one of those identity things. You like to be a person who likes this to exist. You just don't want to actually be involved in the games. Oh, I would never play this deck myself. It's not fun to me. It's also not fun to play against or watch. Oh, it's fun to play against. <laughs> I like playing against this deck. With your burn deck? Yeah, I love it, personally. It's great. It's interesting? That's stimulating to you? Yeah, I mean, it's not an interesting matchup, no. No, it's not an interesting matchup. It's not It's not a deck full of interesting match although he does you know war of invention go get witch bane orb and i guess that's it you're you're cold uh i mean you, they kind of have to have i mean it's it's a it's an uphill climb if they're playing against burn because like they have bridge but bridge isn't particularly effective which bane orb's kind of slow and nothing saves them from eidolon anyway so if you have an eidolon on board like they're just pirate spell bomb yeah it's pr- it's an expensive way to because they're not going to be there's one copy of pirate spell bomb one copy of abrupt decay and they're 60 like, they, all their entire dude, deck is dude, that triggers it. Dude, dude, if they just get, uh, if they can just get Ensnaring Bridge, Witchbane Orb, and Pyrite Spellbomb, you know, they've got one of each. No, I guess they have three bridges, but if they can get, if, yeah, if they get their one Witchbane Orb and their one Abrupt Decay to kill your, your Eidolon, and they get, you know, like, you know, they, you know, they got a little something going. Yeah, they have literally no way to stop your proactive plan in the first four turns. They're just taking every Lava Spike, right? Like, yeah, I don't know, man. This deck is awful. It's, this it's, deck is awful to exist. This is, this is just, it's like, have you ever wanted to watch eggs? Well, now there's a deck that makes you realize how good you had it back when you could watch eggs. <laughs> um, so do you think – so what's offensive about this? Is it takes a long time to win? No. It's not interesting. It's not compelling. It's boring to watch. The things that it's it, – the things involved in it – I mean what – Whatever. Hopefully, people can just play more artifact removal, and it's not even an issue. I just, besides, Mox Opal should have been gone a long time ago, anyway. But you know what? Maybe this isn't the time. There's a good chance that uh, it's 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 fine for now because this deck's probably not actually that good when people are aiming for it. But man, is this a miserable! I mean, it is not a pleasant experience to play with or against for most people in most circumstances. If people just play the Ancient Grudge, so he played an Ancient Grudge himself, right, in his sideboard. If people just played... Everybody Ancient- plays the sideboard cards that beat themselves. They always do, because they know. They always know. It's like all the dredge people always have all the ley lines. Yeah. You know, and all the... Uh, all the Tron people have, like, Ghost Quarter or something. Everybody always has the yeah, stuff that, that would beat them. But you don't you think can't Yellow stand... Hat should have Crucible of Worlds? 
Yeah, he's going to win anyway. He's got other stuff. He's got a gate. He's got the stuff that matters. I'm he just has saying big that yellow like yellow hat. That's that's a really powerful yeah. ability in yeah. the mirror. But so seriously, if people just played like three or four copies of Ancient Grudge in their sideboard instead of the the specific anti artifact or anti enchantment artifact cards they're playing right now, like. Ancient Guards murders this deck, right? You take out a single yeah. key artifact, and the entire thing falls apart. Uh, one of the other reasons that I, I was just kind of chuckling that if John had made top eight, this deck has almost no way to defend itself against Tron, right? Like, they're just going to cast an Ulamog or, you know, an Oblivion Stone or something like that. And just this, this deck's entire game plan is on the table, and it's, it's playing off. I mean, granted, it, it has some ability to control what's on the top, but, like, it can't stop you from casting and then attacking with an Ulamog, for example. Yeah, it actually it's it, it's good to note that while uh, most previous versions of uh, Lantern have played a bunch of surgical extractions, he doesn't actually have any in his seventy five, so he can't do the like mill one of the Tron pieces and then surgical you. Um, yeah, or I guess is there no defense against Worldbreaker? It's a really really tough matchup, I think. So, yeah, it's really tough. Uh, and, you know, I, th- I think that it's fine to have this deck exist uh, because I like, I, I don't know, I like what it represents, but I agree with you. I certainly didn't like Jerry getting 0-3'd by it in the finals. I was really excited when Jerry made the finals, but that's that's more personal than than kind of deck. Yeah, I think there's a good chance that they're not going to do anything because it's not even like the seventh best deck. It's just that it's so miserable. And it just slows things down and makes things so obnoxious. The only reason it's not as slow as some of the other, like, Sensei's Devon and Top things is because enough people realize that you can literally give up. It's <laughs> just don't play. But what about Ancient Stirrings, right? Banning Ancient Stirrings is kind of in line with banning a lot of the, the cards that, that we, we've seen banned in the format so far. Uh, yeah, but I think the Ancient Stirrings is not necessarily promoting as bad. I, I, Mox Opal is going to be a problem someday eventually. I'm saying, you know, don't do anything if you don't want to. It's whatever. I just think that someday, someday, Mox Opal is going to get its due. It's, it's some, it, <laughs> One way or the other, eventually Mox Opal will fall. It could be this year. It could be three years from now. We'll see. Eventually, Mox Opal... You know, just don't be surprised. Okay. Mox Opal, heard it here. You're on notice. You're, uh... But I, don't, I don't think they're going to do anything now. In trouble, it, buddy. It, yeah, no, nah, I don't know. It's like one of those, yeah, you and I are in trouble, too. You know, like, we might die when we're 84. <laughs> no way. <laughs> do you know what kind of science there's going to be by the time we're 84? 84 is well, be like the new... No, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. I, I know there's going to be a lot of science by the time I'm 84. Yeah, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it's coming up pretty quick. Oh, yeah, my 84 comes up, a, I don't know, a good three years before yours, right? Oh, more than that, at least. Yeah. You've got momentum. <laughs> like, <laughs> Speaking of momentum... <laughs> Go ride your momentum and, uh, you know, find us all the cool places. Find us at toplevelpodcast.com or on Instagram or on Facebook, on Twitter. And you thought I was going to say something else, but I'm going to say YouTube. You can find us there. Uh, Or find us on Patreon, where we're also Top Level Podcast. Uh, One person who found us on on Patreon and supports us is Sean O'Brien. Shout out to Sean. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Cool beans on modern. Oh my god! Don't bring cool beans back. <laughs> it's I not won't. time. I've already failed. <laughs> it's not time. It's not time. It's it's not it's not like one of those disco things where you can just bring it back every three or four years. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> but uh, hot beans on modern. Hot beans. It is like in Chile. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know it's. It, we're definitely interested in hearing, uh, you know, your thoughts on uh, what action, if any, should be taken. But I'm also curious what people's predictions are for the uh, the best performing deck at the uh, first Grand Prix after, uh, at, you know, the first modern Grand Prix after this PT, you know. Be, I'm going to be interested because my prediction, we're going to see a very, we're going to see a lot of change compared to this one. I think there's going to be a lot of adjustments made by people that are going to cause a 
a different set of decks to end up on top. Six burn decks in the top eight is what you're saying. Mm, no. No? No? No. Uh, PPTQs for Team Unified are going on right now, too. So if you can't make a Grand Prix, you can play with your friends if you uh, win a PPTQ. Red. All right, man. Bye, Patrick. Good night. See you next week. Life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge into jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core I trapped in amber stasis. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with nothing but time. Parents and my friends were the key to find. Magic gave me purpose and drive. The game, the love, 